Okay, welcome to Year 9 Science Online with Annie Van Vieren. Good morning Year 9s, um, hope you had a great weekend. I was glad to see some of the rain fall out there. And um, yeah, happy Star Wars Day. I'm recording this on May the 4th, so May the 4th be with you. Alrighty. Anyways, um, gentlemen, today we are going to continue our talk about flowers and... Um, so the homework that I gave you was on the sexual reproduction of flowers. Now, what does sexual reproduction mean? It simply means that there's a boy part and a girl part. And these two need to get together so that they can make babies. Or in the, in the case of plants, that'll be seeds. Okay. So what is the function of a flower? I want you to start thinking about that while I open up our presentation. Okay, so, look at these flowers. I mean, that is just an amazing orchid. It's called the Holy Ghost Orchid, or, or the Holy Spirit Orchid. It looks like a dove. But, in there, you have the male and the female parts. What is the function of a flower? Look at these. You can see the big anthers. You can see all the petals. And you can see the sepals in the background. An amazing flower. And then over there, with the sticky stigma. So, what is the function of a flower? Function of the flower is about attracting pollinators and getting pollinators to bring the male part, which is the pollen, which contains the sperm cell, bring the sperm and bring it and stick it onto the sticky stigma. Okay, so that pollination can occur. Extremely, extremely important. Okay, now, um, yeah, so I always joke and say, if you get hay fever, and you get hay fever because of pollen, then you're allergic to plant sperm. Think about it. The sperm is in the pollen. Ugh. Anyways, so the only reason they look so pretty is to attract pollinators. The reason why they give away nectar is to attract pollinators. They want the pollinator to go deep into the area there where the nectar is, so they can get the sweet, sweet, yummy nectar, be covered in pollen, and then when they fly to the next flower, they take that with them and deposit it on the sticky stigma. So, we have, we know all the parts, we know the nectary is down here, we know this is the anther, and the anth, oh sorry, that's the anther, this is the stamen, and this thin is called the filament, so altogether it's the filament. The female part of the flower is the pistil, the pistil consists of the sticky stigma, the style, the ovary and then the ovules. So here comes Mr. B. Mr. B goes and says, mm, I need some yummy yummy nectar to make my honey. And I crawl through all of these anthers. And the anthers then deposit their pollen on the bee. The bee then flies to the next next flower to get some of the nectar and as he goes in he touches the sticky stigma and the pollen is deposited on that. Then the pollen will actually grow a tube called the pollen tube all the way down all the way down into the um, into the ovary and all the way up to the ovule and when it gets to the ovule the sperm and the egg can may merge and that will create a new seed okay all right so how does pollination happen it's not always bees it can sometimes be the birds and the bees. Ha! Huh? Have you had the talk about the birds and the bees yet? Anyways, that's where the joke comes from. So it can be bees, it can be butterflies, it can be wind pollination, like tomatoes. Tomatoes go through wind pollination. Look at this, we even have self-pollination. On the same flower, you have the, um, the pollen sitting there and then ending up on the stigma of the same flower. Now flowers have different ways of preventing this. Some of them will have their pollen becoming ripe or ready and released before the stigma is ready to receive or the other way around. Then you have self-pollination which is on the same plant not the same flower. So again the pollen from one goes on to the stamen of the other but it's still the same plant so it's the same DNA. Then we have cross-pollination where from one plant to another plant and this is the ideal for the plant because it creates variation and then lastly we have literally artificial pollination especially in some of our 
um, industries like the fruit industry and so forth, you would have humans going around with a little paintbrush and painting the pollen onto the stigmas to make sure that they know what is going on. This is very useful in research. Now what about some weird and wonderful pollinators which you haven't thought of in the past? So here we have the Tui, okay, everybody's favorite New Zealand bird. Now look at that yellow stuff on his forehead. That is actually not feathers, that's all pollen. And it's from the flax plant. And as you can see, the flax plant is designed in such a way, it grew and developed and evolutionary developed in such a way. So you have the anthers all stick out. So the filaments carry the anther all the way to the top. The tui sticks his beak all the way down into there to get to the nectary to drink the nectar. But as he does that, he picks up the pollen. Then he goes to the next one. And as he sticks his beak into the next flower, he's depositing that pollen onto the sticky stigma right there. We even have lizards doing that. Okay? I've I think the New Zealand gecko, there's one of the New Zealand geckos who also do this. Um, I found a passing reference to that, but I don't know, it was a little bit dodgy. So, but this is from Brazil, a specific gecko down there, and loves to drink the nectar, and as he goes in, you can see he picks up the pollen. Now, what about other weird and wonderful pollinators? Okay, can you guys think of any others? Have a look at this. Lemurs. Pollination by lemur. How cool is that? They actually pollinate some of the flowers in Madagascar. Pollination by beetle or stink bug. Pollination by moth. And the hummingbird, which is amazing. Do you know the hummingbird flaps its wings so fast that it can actually hover like a helicopter in one place? It can fly backwards. The smallest hummingbird is about the size of a big wasp talking about wasps, wasps will also pollinate. Ants will pollinate because they're after the nectar, which contains a lot of sugars. And look at this, mice and other little rodents can go in and off. They're after the pollen, oh, sorry, after the nectar, they will then get pollen on them and transfer it to the next. Look at this amazing photo of a bat doing the same thing. You can see there's an anther there's the filament and there's a the stigma. So as he's going in, he actually will pick up some of the pollen and then fly to the next flower and deposit that onto. And he's not doing this on purpose, he's just off the food. And that's why the plants need to reward them. Excellent guys, so I just recorded the whole second part of this video and my microphone was muted. Haha. <laughs> so let me just make sure that it is currently recording. Yes it is. I don't want to make that mistake again. Yay! Anyways, I've showed you this picture before. Look at that amazing nectar droplet there and the individual pollen grains on the bee. They are hard working guys for us. Okay, so um these are just amazing photographs. You can see how they take the pollen from flower to flower. So cross-pollination, we've already talked about. It's when you have pollen go from one plant to the other. And self-pollination is when either on the same plant or on even on the same flower. Okay? And cross-pollination is the best for making sure we have a healthy offspring. Because it's different DNA. So animals, insects, wind, and also water. I haven't mentioned water yet, but when a water droplet falls onto a flower, it can obviously splash up that pollen and have it fall onto a different stigma. So as we said earlier, flowers are all about sexual reproduction. What does sexual reproduction mean? Sexual reproduction means when the pollen that contains the sperm falls onto the stigma, it will then grow down a pollen tube and the sperm and the egg can merge to form a zygote, which then turns into a seed. So sexual reproduction simply means that male and female is involved. So pollination, don't get, please don't get confused with pollination and fertilization. They ask this question regularly and people fall into the trap. Pollination is simply when the pollen ends up on the sticky stigma. That's it. Pollen from the one flower or the same flower, but from the anther to the sticky stigma. That is pollination. Then it grows down. 
the pollen tube and then fertilize the eggs. So fertilization is when the egg and the sperm fuse to form a zygote. Really, really important. Okay, so here you can see it. Here comes the pollen. La la la, it lands on the sticky stigma. It like, ooh, it starts growing down a pollen tube and goes down to where the ovules are in the ovary. And here comes the sperm and it travels all the way down and then it says, hey, egg cell, let's merge. And they create a new zygote, a new individual. Okay, so here comes the pollen. Oh, turning ourselves into fruit and that eventually turns the, the seeds which then turn into a fruit. So here comes the pollen again, going down, 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 down with the pollen tube and then the sperm can travel down the pollen tube to merge with the ovule or the egg cell in the ovule and when they merge it forms a zygote and that zygote turns into a seed and every fertilized ovule will form a seed. Okay, this then develops into a fruit. Look carefully at this kiwi fruit. Look very carefully. Okay, see this part here. If you think about it, that that kiwi fruit used to be this area here. Think about it. this is the sepals, right there. The sepals that you can still see, and possibly some of the petals that have remained. So consequently, this thing was the ovary. It was that thing that turned into this kiwi fruit. Let's look closer. If you look at that, those are the sepals. This is obviously where your nectary was. Okay, and then look at the actual little tubes that grow to every single seed. Those are the pollen tubes. So this was the base of the flower. And over here was the top of the flower. What was at the top? The stigma was at the top. And you can see when the pollen landed on the sticky stigma, it grew and it grew down these pollen tubes to eventually reach the ovule and turn that into the little seeds. Cool, eh? Next time you cut a strawberry open, please look at the pollen tubes. Same thing. It comes from the top. Remember, this is the bottom because that's where the sepals are. From the top down into the ovule. Okay, so over here, what happened here? Why is this corn um, or maize so weird? It's because they didn't have good pollination. Only the fruits or the actual seeds that developed were ones that were pollinated. The rest were not. So this was not good pollination. Okay. The most punishing of fertilization techniques used by plants involve not sexual deception, but imprisonment, penal servitude. Gull colonies in the Mediterranean, as anywhere else in the world, are busy, noisy places full of activity as parent birds come and go tending their chicks. They're also messy, smelly places with droppings, misplaced bits of half-digested fish and dead bodies lying about all over the place. In short, for flies and ants, they are very heaven. And beside some gull colonies, you may find one of these. This is not an image of a sexy, seductive female animal. The mimicry is more gruesome. This is a bogus corpse, mimicking rotting flesh covered with hair and giving off the putrid smell of carrion. It's the dead horse, Arum. Blowflies find this highly attractive. They need to find a hole to get into a corpse, and this seems to be one. Within are a whole cluster of tiny flowers. Those at the top are male, but they're not yet ripe. Below is a barricade of spines, and below them 
the female flowers. Some of the flies have already visited such a flower as this and are carrying cargoes of pollen. Down here, in a real corpse, they might have found succulent rotting flesh on which to feast and lay their eggs so that later their maggots could also feed, but they find nothing. As they continue to search, pollen brushes off them onto the stigmas. The spikes discourage them from getting out. By now it's getting dark and flies don't fly at night, they're stuck. During the night, the male flowers suddenly shed their pollen. And during the night too, the spikes of the barricade shrivel. So by the morning, the flies are free to go. And each takes with it a load of pollen from the male flowers. video we're going to talk about seed dispersal um, please um, look on the OLE make sure that you complete all the um, pages that I've given you on your site bed thank you very much have a great day bye